Hi, I'm Andrea Savo here with REDB.net, and I've got Tom Painter of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and Jay Famlietti of the UCI professor. He, he actually teaches Earth System Science, here to talk to us about water. Hello, Tom and Jay. Hello. So I want to tell our audience a little bit about water, and I understand you have two sort of different specialties in, in terms of water. So let's talk a little bit about groundwater, Jay. Sure. So um, I work with uh, satellites and develop computer models to uh, look at how water availability, in, in particular groundwater, uh, is changing all over the world. And um, like we talked about this evening, it's, it's uh, especially in California and the Western US, it's not a pretty picture. And, and you, Tom, talked about um, snow water and the snow packs, is that right? That's right. Yeah, so I, I focus on the mountain snow pack and likewise use satellites and uh, airborne uh, technologies to look at mountain snow packs around the world. In many of the the uh, places of the world where there's great water tension, that tends to be where deserts and mountain snowpack come together. Um, so being able to understand that mountain snowpack really well is critical then in what are very geopolitically tense regions. All right, and you were talking a little bit about water usage and how even if our, our water bills doubled, that we might not even notice that, but that this is a very important resource that we that is dwindling. Can you tell our audience a little bit about um, what they should be aware of and sort of cautious of? Well, so, so the analogy that I gave there is, yeah, if, you, if your water bill doubled, you're not gonna feel it because it's right now it's priced to, uh, for you to use. Uh, the true value of water really shows up when people start messing with your region's water. So another region starts messing with yours, and then the number of attorneys that are involved and uh, the levels of state and federal uh, government that show up and start dealing with that, that's where the true value of water really starts to appear. For instance, in California, the, the state economy is driven by the water resource, and about 80% of that comes from snowmelt, uh, industry, agriculture, uh, and then lowly on this list is uh, domestic use, but those two big ones, industry and, and agriculture, are the big drivers of use of that water. We're in a drought here in Southern California. How does that affect our um, water usage and how we should be sort of taking care of our own individual behavior? The drought uh, is uh, worse than ever, really. Uh, the situation here, in California, it collectively represents a number of all-time lows. You know, lowest snowpack, lowest precipitation, low stream flows, uh, low groundwater availability. And so that's already translating into um, a lack of surface water availability, a lack of water being uh, moved, say, from snow melt from the Sierras down, down to here to Southern California. And the situation that we're in right now is one where the governor has asked us to cut our personal water usage by 20%. That's something that we have to take uh, very seriously. And agriculture is uh, put in a very difficult situation because their uh, surface water allocations have also been cut way back. In fact, in many cases, they've been cut to zero. Uh, for the first agri time. For the first time ever. And so that means a couple of things. There won't be enough water. That means that farmers will have to use more groundwater and uh, we'll be depleting that. Uh, that's more of a finite reserve, so we'll be, be depleting that very quickly. Uh, so we're in, you know, we're in a rough spot. I've yeah. heard that yeah. the oceans are getting larger. Yes, right, sea level, sea level is rising. So with respect to uh, what we see with global water issues, there's a, there's a few key things that we're seeing. One is that the amount of precipitation, the amount of evaporation, the amount of stream flow from from the continents, from the you know the big land masses of the world, all of that's increasing. Okay, uh, so that means there's more water moving through the water cycle, just like you know, just like we all learned about in elementary school. The second thing that we're seeing is that there's much more variability or much more extreme extremes. So we're seeing the frequency and intensity of flooding and drought increasing. The third thing is that we're seeing the wet areas getting wetter and the dry area is getting drier. And so those three things together collectively we call an intensification or a strengthening of the water cycle. Okay, so the strengthening of the water cycle, how does this affect us? Well, so 
you hear a lot about Arctic sea ice and, and the melt of that, and uh, there's great concern over that, over what that will do in terms of uh, heating uh, the full the full system, because it we lose that reflective white and replace it with uh, Arctic Ocean, right, which absorbs a lot more sunlight and heats that and heats the ocean. So that's one way in which the, the hydrologic cycle is intensified. Another is what happens with what's called the cryosphere, the, the snow and ice, um, by changing precipitation from snow, what had been snow, uh, into rain, all of a sudden that water is ready to go. It can, be, it can be evaporated quickly, it can be used by plants quickly, which then transpire that, and so it keeps that water more mm -hmm. active. It keeps That's it right. in circulation. That's right. Right? right. It's, not, uh, it's not unlike in the old days when we used to uh, thaw out our freezers. Right, they'd, be, they'd get full of ice and you'd have to thaw them out. And so when that water is frozen, it's not moving around, right? right. And when it starts to thaw out, it can really move around. And so that's an additional concern of, of the melt of glaciers, the Himalayan glaciers, which are a huge amount of ice. Um, by, by snowpack melting away earlier, it exposes that glacier ice to more energy, and those melt. Right? And if you take that, if you melt that, it doesn't the next year turn back into glacier ice. Glacier ice takes a long time to make. And so by, by melting that and having it run down the river, there's that much right. more water that is in this in, the water in this water cycle right. and, and right. cycling through. And that's you know that's really underappreciated, Tom. Is that the uh, melt from the ice sheets and the melt from the glaciers is really, to use a technical term, we would say it's forcing the the strengthening of the water cycle. It is taking water that was literally in the freezer, thawing yeah. it out and letting it move around. So this is ultimately a good or bad thing. Yeah. It can be both. Okay, um, because there are many regions around the world, especially alpine regions uh, and high altitude uh, regions that rely on, say, the, the, the glacial melt for, uh, for freshwater resources. But a lot of it comes down to the speed at which things are happening. And the speed at which things are happening uh, is so fast that it can be a little bit overwhelming. So we don't have time to perhaps build the infrastructure to trap the water or for these mountain communities to be able to deal with uh, the increased melting, the, the possibility of the flooding. So a lot of it has to do with the, with the timing. It sounds like more is better, and in some cases it is, but I think what we're seeing in it is that in a lot of cases, because of the intensity issue, whether it's a drought or a flood, is not necessarily good. Yeah, and you look at um, those regions that maybe are a little bit limited for water and they get a little bit more in terms of agriculture, say. So what's, th what's the payoff in that in terms of economy relative to, say, the Hurricane Sandy uh, costs? And with sea level rise, the infrastructure destruction, storm damage involved as sea level rises. Uh, I think the just looking at it in terms of dollars, that that dwarfs what the benefits can be for those who, say, may, may pick up uh, more crops mm -hmm. in a particular mm -hmm. year. And the first world uh, is going to suffer largely in terms of infrastructure. Uh, third world is going to suffer in terms of, uh, of horrible disease from, from bad water quality or no water um, in terms of fresh water, drinking water. Uh, or in terms of crops. Um, and so, so the suffering mm -hmm. is scaled. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So one of the issues with the developing world uh, and with these more extreme extremes is one of resiliency. So in the developed world, it's a lot, it's a lot not that we want to see these things happen, but it's easier for us to recover from, uh, from a big shock, from a, from a huge flood or from, or from a drought. In the developing world, it can be extremely destabilizing. They don't really have the capacity to uh, to withstand, right, to withstand these things and to withstand an increasing frequency of these things. Well, thank you so much for the research right. and the education that you're both doing. I'm Andrea Sava with redb.net, and thank you for watching. Wow.